vowels. Okay, the vowel markings. Um, the first thing that we need to know, remember, if you don't know, I think most of us do already, but a uh, nice review for us anyway, um, is that in Hebrew, in written Hebrew, there are no vowels. It is simply consonants. So, if you, if you were called up in the synagogue, if you were called up, called up to read from the scroll from the Torah, they would open it up, it would simply be the consonants, there would be no vowels. So you have to know what the vowels are. And there are some telltale signs that would tell you what the vowels are. Um, most of this is, comes from the sages, it comes from the Talmud, which tells us where, what the vowel markings are and these kinds of things. Um, There are times, uh, for example, Rashi will discuss why this vowel is used and not that vowel. Because when you have the, the consonants, every word, every Hebrew word is made up of a three root word, a three, three letter root. Um, almost, every, almost every word, Hebrew word, has three letters, is, has a three letter base, three letter root. And those of you coming in, the significance of the Hebrew is that as you were going through each of these letters and learning the significance and all of that, well, that is put into the word. So you have Aleph here. And what was the significance of Aleph? Strength. Okay. And you have Beit, a house. And so you put the two of them together, Aleph and Beit, and you have Father. Father. Av. Av. You have Father? Who is what? He's the strength of the house. Okay? This is basically the way Hebrew works. So every Hebrew word has this, almost every Hebrew word, not everyone, but almost every Hebrew word has this three letter root. And. Um, the, the middle is called the parent, and then the outside letters are called the children. Okay? And so the parent is the core, and the children are adding to it. And this is how this is, the, in effect, the defining of a Hebrew word. All, because all of the strength of those letters go into that word. Okay? So, um, the, the consonants... You have consonants making up a Hebrew word. But there are no vowels. Now there are vowel sounds, but there are no vowels written in actual Hebrew. So if you come up to read the Torah, you look at the scroll, it's all consonants. And you have to basically figure out what is being said by just the consonants. Okay? Um... If you go to Israel, you will notice that many of the signs and such as that, many of, much of the writing in Israel is also that way. They don't use the vowel markings because they already know what the words are. So you can basically look at a word and you recognize it, you know what that word is. So you know how it's pronounced, okay? But it would be as though I would go like this. So what does that say? <coughs> like so well done. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> you don't know what it says unless you know the context. You can peek into my brain. You won't see anything. You can peek into my brain. Okay? So this is basically what Hebrew would look like written in English. And you have to kind of figure out what's being said here. Okay? So, but we can add the vowels. Let's add the vowels like they do in Hebrew.
Now what? Okay. So it's like that. Now, the scroll that we have is what is called a learner scroll. Okay. So it's got the vowel markings in it. So the scroll that we use has the vowel markings in it. Still hard to read because it has the crownlets and the decorations and things like that, and the you print is kind of small. Letters, but they're not yeah, and you, and, and <coughs> so, so you, it, it's, you have to be careful because it's very easy to confuse letters, because as you know, several of the consonants look like each other, and you have to figure out which one is which, because it's being decorated, and it kind of changes the way you're used to one script, and now you have another script. Nora's having fun with her homage because it's got Rashi script in it, uh, which is a form of cursive, and she's trying to figure that one out. So, <laughs> uh, so you have uh, this. This is what Hebrew would look like in English. Okay. So that is there are there in in actual Hebrew there are no vowel markings. There's no vowel markings. There are vowel sounds, but there's no vowel markings. In approximately 600 of the Common Era, there was a group of rabbis and sages who came together, and they were called the, the Mas Masorim. Masorim. Okay. And these men were working on the scrolls and the Torah and such as this and working on the Talmud and uh, they they were trying if you remember that by that time uh, the Jewry the, the Jews were scattered all over the world by now because of the because of the destruction of uh, the Roman uh, the destruction of, of Israel and uh, Jerusalem and the Romans took the Jews, many of the Jews, and took them into Europe and scattered them all over. So the Masoim were working on the Torah scrolls and such as that. Um, and so you have, from them, you have what is called the Masoretic text. The Masoretic text is the text that most of our English Bibles come from. The King James, the New King James, the NIV, the the uh, um, yes, all of these, all of these Bibles. These, these all come from the Masoretic text. Okay. So these men were the ones who came up with the Masoretic text. So. Because the Jewish people were losing, they're, they're living all through Europe and such as that, they're losing contact with their Hebrew. Because they're having to learn all these other languages. <clears throat> Latin, French, Spanish, German. They're having to learn all these other languages. And you know what happens when, you know, you live in a country for so long. Um, you lose some of your identity. Okay? Even the Orthodox Jews, uh, to a great extent, lost a lot of the, the Hebrew. They switched over to Yiddish, which basically is a mixture of Hebrew and German. And so you have these kinds of issues taking place. You have, uh, they're, being, they're being immersed in their society and the societies in which they're living and everything like that. So they're losing, um, they're, they're losing contact with Hebrew, with Judaism, with these things. So what the Masoim did was in order to encourage Hebrew study, in order to help these people, 
because they're trying to read Torah scrolls and such as that, and the Torah doesn't have vows. And these people are far away from any religious center or anything like that. So the Masorim put vows in. They, they are the ones who came up with the vow markers. Okay? So, they came up, the, the Masorim came up with the vows. And vows, the vow markers are called Nikudot. So everybody say Nikudot. Nikud, yes. Okay. So for a single vowel, Nikud. So this is plural. And those of you who've been here, that's plural what? Feminine. Feminine. Okay. So Nikudot. Nikud is a vowel. Bell placement. So this represents any Hebrew letter. Any of these letters can fit in the X. <clears throat> so bell placement will be in one of two places. Almost always. Okay? Ma the majority will be here, underneath the letter. Occasionally, it will be here. So if it's not here, then you look here. If it's not here, and it's not here, then it it's going to be a consonant, what is called a consonantal vowel. It's a consonant acting as a vowel. So it will be here, for example, the vowel. So if you don't see a vowel here, and you don't see a vowel up here on the top, then, it, then the next letter. Usually. There's always an exception. There will always be the exception. Okay? So that's the way it, it usually works. So. This is vowel placement, and this is vowel placement. This can be vowel placement. Everybody with me? Everybody got it? Everybody understand? Any questions? What we are so far? So, the way you read Hebrew, we'll, do, we'll start with this one. So these are, these are, uh, there'll be three letters, okay? So these are three of any of the consonants. These represent three of any of the consonants, okay? These represent any of the vowels. So the way you would read Hebrew is you start with the top consonant, with the first consonant. Remember that Hebrew reads right to left. Right to left. So that means if you open up a Hebrew book, for example, I have my Siddur here, my prayer book. So I have my Siddur here. This is my prayer book. Okay. Usually, you would, this would be the front, right? like this Bible here. This would be the front and you open it up. But if you open up a Hebrew book, you find that you've not opened it up to the front, you've opened it up to the back. Why? Because for us, it's backwards. So I have to hold the book backwards. Okay? A few sh Shabbatot ago, a couple of Sabbaths ago, uh, we were trying to read from the Torah scroll and I got confused, I forgot what I was doing, and I started rolling the scroll the wrong way. And then I got completely lost. 
So I had to come back and roll the scroll all the way back afterwards, roll the scroll all the way back and start over and read through so I could catch up to what Parsha we were on. So here, if what would be the back of an English book is the front of a Hebrew book. Okay? Because it's from right to left. The start of the book is right. It's the right side of the book. Okay? And then when you're reading Hebrew, so here you have the preface and the introduction and background on prayers, etc. And then you come into the Rachot. Okay? And so the Rachot, you're reading right to left. Right to left, everything is right to left. Okay? And so... Um, So we're, we're going right to left. Alright, so you have so the way you read Hebrew. The way you read Hebrew, right to left, you start with the first consonant. Now remember that this consonant may or may not have a sound. Because we know that there are how many letters that don't have sounds? Two. There are two letters that do not have sounds in the Hebrew alphabet, Aleph Bet. And they are Aleph and Ayin do not have a sound. So understand that this first consonant may not have a sound. If it does not have a sound, then the word begins with the sound of the vowel. But you still start here. Okay? So the way you read is you start here. You come down. Okay? So you make the sound of this consonant. Then you make the sound of its vowel. Then what? Back up to the next consonant and down to its vowel and then back up to the next consonant. So, it's kind of like reading piano music. Anybody here play the piano? By note? I play it by ear because my nose gets in the way. <laughs> You play by note, and you're looking at two staffs, right? And so there can be anywhere from one note to how many? A full chord, right? So you can have four notes at the top and four notes at the bottom. And it's really fun when they get into sixteenths and, right, thirty seconds. And you're trying to read all of that, and if it's a nice, good, fast song. So what do your eyes do when you're reading the music? You do two things. Number one, you read ahead. Mm. <coughs> you read ahead. Okay? <coughs> Number two, you have to be... Your eyes need to go top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, top to bottom, quickly. Okay? Now, when you start first reading, when you first start reading, take your time and go slow. I've told you many times, I'm like a fifth grader teaching first graders how to read. Okay? So, I'm not, I'm not proficient and I'm not fast. But what helps is when you practice. So the information that you have learned up to this point, you need to put into practice. How do you do that? By reading. Okay? By attempting it. Now, when you were in first grade and you were attempting to learn how to read to begin with, did you know all of the letters and all of the sounds as soon as you walked into class? No. How did you learn? Repetition. Repetition, step by step. Right? You learn repetition, step by step. A little here, a little there. My first grade teacher, teaching me how to read. We didn't have kindergarten, we didn't have preschool, any of those kinds of things. My first grade teacher. 
was teaching us the alphabet. <clears throat> when you could say the alphabet perfectly, without fault, without hesitation, she had a bag of candy in the closet in the room. And you could go and you could pick any, not, not a big candy bar, but just a little piece of candy, but you could go and pick any candy out of that bag that you wanted. So she would have us sit there with flashcards and what have you, and uh, uh, we would have to practice with the flashcards, and so she would have us pairing up, and, and we would practice with each other, A, B, C, D, and we'd hold up the flashcards, mix them all up, and hold them up, and what is this letter? That's an M. What is this letter? That's an S. What is this letter? That's a K. What is this letter? But by the end of it all, you had to be able to sit in front of her, sit at her desk, and quote, as she held up, you had to be able to say, first of all, the alphabet all the way through. And then she would pull up all of the flashcards out of order. And you had to be able to recognize the letter, tell her what it was without fault. If you made a mistake, you had to go back and start all over again. <clears throat> no candy for you. It took me three attempts to get my candy. I had particular a particularly difficult time with the letters M and N. I called flashcards for a reason, right? She holds it up. And then she holds it up. Is that an M or an N? So why I'm telling you this is because you need to do the same thing with the Hebrew. I can give you all the information that I can possibly give you. But if you don't put it into practice, it does nothing for you. And you don't get any better. Okay? So it's kind of like sticking a, sticking a book under your pillow and expecting to absorb the information. It doesn't work. Okay? So you need to practice. How do, how do you practice? Well, uh, most of us have either phones or computers or these kinds of things. There are a lot of places online that you can that you can go to that where they have places where you can practice okay um, me I have a Sidor and so that's one of the ways that I practice but I also um, I, I read Rashi's commentaries in Hebrew and in English so that I can get a sense of the Hebrew as well as the English <coughs> Um, I go to, I, I read the Talmud in, in both languages I, so that I get a sense of it. You will start recognizing words. <clears throat> and all of a sudden you'll say, I know that word. And it starts making some sense to you. Okay? But what I'm saying to you, since we're starting a new class, what I'm saying to you, to all of you, is you need to practice. If you don't practice at home, if you do not practice, you're not going to get anywhere. You will just struggle with it. Okay? So, um, I know everybody's, got, everybody's busy, but you're here for a reason. Uh, a reason. And um, I want you to make good effort of, that, of, of what's going on here with the information that you that you are gaining okay so <clears throat> again the way you read hebrew is consonant first down to the vowel next consonant down to the vowel final consonant okay everybody understand yes now So, what if the vowel marker is here? Same thing. You're going to start with this consonant. Okay, you're going to start with the consonant. Always check here first. This is the primary position of a vowel. So you always check the bottom first. If there's no vowel there, then you look up here. The left corner the left top corner is the next position for the vowel. <clears throat> so in this case, it would be the vowel first, 
uh, or excuse me, the consonant first to the vowel. Then from the vowel to the next consonant, from that consonant to the next vowel, from that vowel to the next consonant. Usually, usually the, the vowel that would be seen here is just a dot, looks like that. And we'll get into it as we get into the vowels, it represents the letter O. And it's the long O. <coughs> Okay, so you look down here first, there's nothing there, so you're going to look up here. Everybody got it? Questions? Now, everybody got this? Okay, erase. One more scenario for you. Um, that doesn't work. Let's see. Um, let's make it a four letter word. And we'll do this. Okay. Now, I have four consonants. The X represents any consonant. Except, let's put this consonant in here. Okay, so what consonant is that? The vowel. The vowel. Okay, so this is a vowel. Now, if I'm like this, if the word is like this, how do I read it? Tell me. Consonant. consonant. Vowel. vowel. To what? So it's very important that you note the vowel here because that means that what? This fob is going to be what? A consonant. A consonant. Because you already have a vowel here. Now there's a reason I'm telling you this in just a minute. So this is going to be the vav. To what? From the consonant vav to vowel to <coughs> consonant to vowel to consonant. Okay? Now. If if it looks like this, you have a consonant and a vowel. There's no vowel, and there's no vowel. There's no ni could, and there's no ni could. then the vav becomes what is called a consonantal vowel. Okay? And we're going to give you, there are four consonantal vowels, and we're going to give them to you in a little bit. Okay? So the vav becomes a consonantal vowel. Consonantal in that it is actually a consonant, but it's acting in the place of a vowel. So, how many of you remember learning your vowels in school? Do you remember learning vowels in school? So let's say our vowels together. A, E, I, O, U, and sometimes Y. Why do, do we say and sometimes Y? Y is actually a consonant, but sometimes it acts as a vowel. By the way, you're going to learn that the Y in English acting as a vowel works the same way as the Yud. As in, um, let's see. Give me an E Y word, something that ends in E Y. T H E Y. T H E Y. So, if I didn't have the Y on there, I would have what? Okay, I put Y on there. Okay. What does it do? It takes the E and it extends it. Okay? If I have this, what does it do? It takes the sound and it extends it, but notice that it puts a what sound on there. The E, 
they boi boy. In Hebrew, the yud works the same way. Okay? So, now that I have you totally confused, <laughs> that's the way consonantal vowels work. So the vav is a consonantal vowel. So, now I have to look at this because I've got a, a consonant next to a vowel, and now a consonant and a vowel and a consonant. So I have to determine what this vav is representing because it can represent two vowels, one of two vowels depending on where the nikud is. The nikud of the vav, the marking of the vav, okay? So if the nikud is found up here, so I'm looking, I read the consonant first, there's no vowel, so I come over to the vav, okay? I look, if it's here, if the nikud is up here, then that means that this vav is making an O sound. Now remember, I told you that if there's a dot after the consonant at the upper left-hand side, that that is telling you what? If there's a dot, it's a okay. like that, it's an O sound. Okay? Why? Because of the vav. The, cons the consonantal vowel. So this, if the dot is at the top, this is an O sound, as in a long O. Everybody with me? If the dot is to the side, here, it makes it a long U sound. Ooh. Sometimes, because the vav, when it acts as a prefix before a word, so you have this, 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 these are letters, okay? So it's acting as a prefix before the word, okay? You almost always have this little mark right here, like that, okay? The vav is a connector word that means and. So we say, uh, <coughs> Shalom, Brachot, Velaylatov. Okay, so when I say shalom, peace, goodbye, brachot, blessings, the laila tov, the laila, the means and, laila, night, tov, good, and good night. Peace, blessings, and good night. Okay, that's the Hebrew way of saying peace out. <laughs> Only the 60s and 70s children picked up on that one. <laughs> okay, so the vav here, acting as a prefix before the word, is the word and. But sometimes it won't have this mark here, it will have this mark here, and it becomes what? Ooh. Usually this is when there's another labial consonant involved. In other words, the next consonant is going to be a labial. What do I mean labial? As in bait. Because you won't say to labial, you won't say to uh, uh, v, v, two v's together like that. So what am I saying? I'm saying that, in other words, I won't say um, shalom vibrachot. I would say shalom uvrachot. It's still the vav, but because you're not going to put the two v's back to back like that, it's going to be uvrachot. Okay? So, giving you this so that you can kind of be looking out for those vavs. How do you know if the vav is representing the v sound or it's representing 
the O or the U sound? Well, the first thing you do is you look for the vowel under the consonant, no vowel, then you look for the vowel to the upper left of the consonant, no vowel, then that vowel is going to be the vowel. Everybody got it? Questions? Comments? Anybody lost? Okay. So, one more thing for you in grammar tonight. Mental vowels, which are Aleph, Aleph He, He, Ba, ba and U. U. All right, so Aleph, He, Ba, and U. <coughs> so these are the, the, the letters that are consonants, but they can at times act as vowels. So I, huh? I mean, won't we'll do that too. No. No. Exactly. Yeah. These are the these are the four. I guess you could say I would, for the same reason that Olive does, that it makes no sound of itself. It has no sound of itself. So uh, now you can add the. <laughs> the eye. The hey, that's the H sound. The hey acts as a vowel in when it particularly when it comes at the end of a word. Which it will frequently do if the word is what? Feminine. Feminine. Okay? If you have this kind of if you have this kind of any, that's any consonant, it has this mark, this this nikut, and then you have a hey. This right here is telling you that this is this word is feminine, if it's a noun. Okay? So so, can everybody see here? So, I have what letter? Sheen. Sheen. Except it's a Sheen. look at the mark, so it's a C. That's one of the areas where you have to be careful because it looks like this nikud, it looks like it's what? No, no. An o, but your vowel is down here. That's why you always look here first. So that's telling you that this is, there's no mark over here, it's over here. You have shin and you have sin. Okay, so this is sin, sound, 
S. Down here. A. Rach R. A. K. Okay, so what do you have? Sarah. 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 Okay, notice. Notice right here, what did I tell you? When you have a noun that has that configuration at the end, it's telling you what? It's feminine. Okay, so you have Grace K here, and you have this vowel marker. We'll get into the names of them next week. You have this vowel marker here, so it's telling you what? Female. <laughs> female is Sarah female. Is Sarah feminine? Yes. yes. Okay? So that's an example of what we're talking about. Okay? Um, so the purpose of the hay here, the purpose of the hay, by the way, this is why um, the word, the noun, Yeshua, okay, the noun Yeshua, I almost started writing the other way. The noun Yeshua ends in this, but the name ends in this. Why? Because this is what? Feminine form. And the man, feminine form? No. So you have to drop the hey to make it masculine form. Because he's not a girl. He's not a woman. He's a man. So this is why this means, this word means salvation. That's what the angel told them. You shall call his name Yeshua, which means salvation. For he shall save, save his people from their sins. But in calling him Yeshua, if they left the hay there, that would be feminine, so they have to drop the hay. So in Hebrew, this word is not is spelled without the hay. Okay, that's the way you spell his, his name. Yeshua. Okay, if it's this, then it would have the hay at the end, and there you have the female form. Everybody got it? Yeah. Okay, sound it out. Yeah. This would actually be like this. <coughs> yeah. Okay. So you guys good? <coughs> Val marker? No. Val marker? So the bob becomes the vowel. Two. Two. So that's this. So that's the way the hay works. And it's just simply, it doesn't even, it's not even really a sound per se, like when you say sara. But you end it with a little, a little breath. Sarah. Okay? Ahava. Rava. So it's got that, just that little whisp of air at the end of it. Okay? The yud, what I was telling you, that it acts the same way as the y. That if I have a word... And I put a yud there. If there is a dot under this as the as the nikud, as the vowel marker for this consonant, I have a dot here. That is the e sound, usually represented in transliteration as an i, but it's e like that, as in beat. Okay? As in king. So it's the E sound. So what the Y does is it extends the sound just like it does in English for boy. 
It extends the sound of the vowel. <coughs> so this is going to extend the sound of the vowel. <coughs> now we have another mark that looks like this. You'll learn this later. We have another mark that looks like this. Looks like a colon, and it cuts the sound. It's called a katef. It cuts, cut off. It cuts the sound of the vowel. Okay? But the yud will extend it. So the yud can act as a vowel, as a consonant. Ya, the ya sound. Yeshua. Okay? Acting as a consonant there. Or it can be an extension of this vowel. So, how do you know if it's the extension of the vowel and not a consonant? There's no vowel marker under it. There's no nikut under it. And that's telling you that it is connected to this vowel. That it is elongating the sound of the vowel. Okay? Everybody with me? Yes. Everybody understand? So this is your introduction. Okay? This is your introduction to vowels. This is the way the vowels work. In effect. Okay, so what we're going to do next week, we're going to start taking the Nikodot one by one, going through them, explaining them to you, the sounds that they make and how they work. Okay, for example, you're going to find that the very first one, there are two A sounding Nikodot. There are two that sound like A. Ah. Okay, so um, what's the difference between the two? Well, frankly, one is long and one is short. Okay? That's the difference between the two. But well, we'll get into all of that next week. So, five minutes and we go to Trib Life.